So, uh, hello everybody from uh, from Dublin. Uh, I'd like to thank the SPM uh, Deep Water uh, Group Research Group for for the invitation to speak to you um, today. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge a whole bunch of research students and interns who worked with me in the past on this issue of hybrid event beds, and they're kind of listed there underneath my name uh, in roughly chronological order. And then the second thing I'd just like to acknowledge is, is, is the Trebilite Research Group at Leeds, the TRG, because a lot of the work we've done on the hybrid event bed issue has been jointly with, uh, with them. Okay, so where did it all start? So uh, for me, it was the early part of the 1990s. It was the heyday of the big deep water fields in the, in the, uh, in the North Sea. A lot of core was coming to surface and I was lucky enough to see a lot of that core. And it puzzled me greatly because a lot of the uh, sort of existing bed level um, models we had for, for deep water deposits didn't seem to work too well. Uh, in particular, we encountered a lot of what looked like debris flows with complex fabrics like you see in the top, uh, top right there. And those debris flows were interleaved with, with uh, cleaner sandy uh, uh, deposits. And the, the view at the time was very much that the, these um, uh, debris flows were, were, were standalone beds uh, interfingering with the, with, with, with the sands. I mean, one of the puzzling things was the further distal you went in the system, the more prominent and obvious these debris flows were. So that, that was kind of a bit of, bit of a puzzle. The breakthrough came really through recognizing event beds um, and the, the fact that the debris flows were actually linked to the sands. And so we, we call them initially linked debrides to kind of make uh, to make that point. And uh, the idea was that uh, sand bearing flows were acquiring uh, through erosion a lot of mud class and mud, and that this was forcing flow distal flow transformations from more turbulent currents into more laminar uh, debris flows. So that, that was the origin of, of the um, of the link debris and at, at, at the same time um I many other groups were working on particularly on, on flows transitional flows so don low uh, martin guy for example in britannia in the north sea were seeing evidence for flows that, that, that were transitional between laminar and, and turbulent okay so uh we, we sort of matured the concept a bit and we came up with uh with it with a a model event bed that, that, that's shown here. We dropped the name linked debride because what we found was that a lot of people were applying linked debride to the whole event bed when what we meant by it was just, just the debridic part. So we, we devised this uh, model um, event bed that we, we, we refer to as a hybrid event bed to stress that it was a product of more than one flow process. Um, it had five parts to it as illustrated here. And in hindsight, I think this has been quite robust, and it's certainly still a very useful starting point in looking at deep water deposits. Um, um, the, the interpretation has clearly changed over the years. There's been a lot more work done on, on uh, understanding the flow process, a lot more experimental work, like Megan will talk about, and that has really helped us kind of begin to, to understand a bit better the different components of, of, of beds like this. So uh, a five uh, division bed, and uh, as other groups uh, started to work the, these sorts of event beds as well, um, what we can see now is that they occur in quite a few different contexts within deep water systems. And I'll try to illustrate these here. We very much started looking at them in, in, in lobe settings, particularly distal lobe settings, where they seem to be pretty common. Uh, they were also encountered a little bit deeper in, in the outer parts of fans, and it was questionable whether there were actually lobes expressed there. So these were sort of tapered sheets that we found out there. And even deeper in the basin, uh, they were encountered in, in, in um, you know, ponded uh, accommodation. Other groups working on, on the fans themselves, so the Villarnet um, and, and the, the Windermer group, we're, we're looking at uh, similar sorts of beds. They're matrix-rich beds. There's various terms used for these deposits, and they refer to them as, as uh, or at least assign them to sort of avulsion nodes within uh, channel avulsion nodes. 
also uh, they, they were encountered in, in um, sort of channel mouth settings and channel lobe transition zones, particularly in the Karoo, and up against topography where flows were forced to accelerate um, as well. And then a range of other settings shown at the bottom here. So rarely in channels when they backfill, they were encountered. Uh, we've also seen them where the distal parts of, of uh, systems uh, spill into confinement uh, or channels uh, and uh, also in pinch zones followed by expansion zones shown in the bottom bottom right there sort of steering around um, diapirs for example uh, highs or or tectonic structures so the key thing is that they occur in quite a lot of different settings and they they, they come in different flavors in these settings and uh, the, the, the uh, uh, expression of the beds and their fascist tracks will, will vary between these uh, settings. So just a couple of quick examples from the uh, or, or, or example from the Ross. Um, um, we're in a sort of a channel mouth type setting here, a lot of scar, this is a scar surface and onto it we can see pinching out uh, a nice pair of uh, what we would call hybrid event beds with uh, H1 sands not much of a H2 expression here, but nice H3 three divisions as well. And again, a common context, they often fill topography or fill or smooth rugos rugosity. Uh, somebody said once they're, they're a bit like self-leveling cement. So I think that's a really good description of them. Okay, a few, few I mean, we're still really trying to understand these things. So a few, few uh, uh, issues highlighted here that we can kind of discuss later. Firstly, there's a bit, a bit of a discussion about the extent of longitudinal fractionation in the flows as they acquire the, the clay and, and, and mud flats and separated longitudinally along the length of the flow versus vertical stratification of the flow and, and, and the deposit then would, would, would reflect this stratification. So in reality, it's probably a bit of a combination of both these things, but it's still an important thing to think about. The, the, the depositing flows do fractionate material minerals um very very efficiently often secondly they're associated with the, with the extinction of turbulence generally so uh but how does that happen where does it happen uh does it start at the top of the flow and work its way downwards as it may do in some cases or does it start at the bottom of the flow you know if we've got uh, a lot of class and trend moving its bed load to uh, disaggregating and releasing clay low down does it start killing the, the turbulence there, uh, both at that level and higher in the flow? And then thirdly, um, uh, the, the different components of the flow, the sort of laminar and transitional and more turbulent parts of the flow are very different efficiencies and they interact one with the other on the bed. So the, you know, the deposit we're left with, it, it, it's relatively hard to relate to the actual flow itself because you know, there may have been mixing between the different uh, flow components. So that's a bit of an issue as well. Uh, one interesting thing in terms of the vertical um, uh, stratification of the flows uh, is that often the muddy divisions and, and as shown arrowed here contain very dense class. You know, those H3 debris divisions contain very dense uh, cemented class that are transported. So these been, have been exhumed and transported. Uh, and uh, so th th those debris flows had quite a lot of strength to support those class. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. Okay, where are we uh, at at the moment? Well, uh, I think one of the things we're trying to push at the moment is to better characterize the beds and to do it continuously. So a lot, lot of our previous work has been done on kind of spot sampling and plug sampling in beds like this, but it's, it's good to try and look at the continuous variation. And uh, so Arif Hussein, who's been working with me, uh, has just published on, on uh, again, on the ROS using XR, uh, XRF uh, core scanning to look at continuous uh, variations. And, and to try and get a clay, it turns out it's really complicated trying to get at the actual clay content preserved in the uh, uh, in, in the deposit, but this was an attempt to do it in the Ross. It's quite a simple system uh, with just quartz and, and uh, bilite chloride. And uh, that's been really interesting in showing and highlighting the interfaces within the deposits between the different uh, uh, 
uh, divisions and also trends. Uh, you know, sometimes you see very systematic trends in muddier parts of the bed. Uh, other times are they're relatively trendless and probably related to the variable cohesion of, of the different uh, components. Um, and one of the interesting things, and I know uh, Tom Dodds is going to speak a little bit about this uh, in his presentation a bit later, is, is that it's highlighted to us again, and others have noted this too, that the, the H3 division is sometimes at least two components to it, and there's a there's a bit of a a step in the in the clay content uh, within that H3 division. So currently we're kind of thinking, yeah, we should really divide that into a 3A and a 3B. But you know, what is the interface between those two divisions uh, is an interesting question. Very nice example from Brad uh, Barry, and this is from a Triassic Mountain Formation in uh, Alberta, uh, showing exactly that that subdivision of the uh, the uh, page three into into two units. And often you you see class concentrated along the interface, and, and you know that's probably telling us that your know, relative buoyancy of the, of the class is quite important. So that, that's a little bit on the vertical, just on uh, a few quick words on the horizontal um, and lateral changes. So just uh, highlighting some of the work we've been doing in the Ross again with the coring in association with Equinor. Uh, it, it turned out fortuitously, but maybe not fortuitously, that, that the Ross is really has quite a lot of hybrid event beds in it, particularly low down where they, where they completely dominate. And uh, we've managed to continuously core now the, the, the lower part of the Ross in three places in an 18 kilometer long uh, transect. And uh, so the, the Ross fan system came from the west and stepped into the basin west to east. So, you know, stacked virtually, we have several slices through the outer part of the, uh, the Ross system. And, and it, it's full of very, very interesting uh, uh, hybrid event beds, of course, and uh, <laughs> this is the lower part of the section through those three boreholes uh, west to, to east, and they just illustrate what, was, what we what we stack first is is lots of thin, um, muddy, silty event beds with just thin skims of sand underneath them, and uh, sort of sand speckled muds above. Very distinctive event beds, and, and they are the outermost part of the uh, the hybrid prone part of the system. It, it steps out, and, the, and those thin beds stretch at least the 18, 20 kilometers between those boreholes. They get a little bit sandier to the west, but they're still, still dominantly silty. So there's a big fringe of silty deposits out in front of this uh, fan system, and a lot of it was in place as these uh, hybrid, you know, muddy, thin hybrid event beds. Um, and that progresses up, then the sandy part of the system arrives, and you can see very nicely here the lateral trends I think are expressed in many systems in, in, in a similar way. Um, a lot of sand in, in the west uh, and many thicker event beds. I think there's 20 thick event beds here, but by the time we get to the east, there's only only five. So they're, they're, they're pinching out. The green here is, is the, the page three debridic part of the bed, and we can see it increases down dip, and that's why when we looked at those North Sea cores, it was always very puzzling. Uh, the, 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 the debrites replace the uh, sandy part of the bed. And the bed re remains a relatively similar thickness. So that, that's another very sort of common uh, characteristic. So these are some of the, the, the very earliest fringe of the system that we see. It, it creates this silty succession. Very little background in here. It's nearly all event beds, but you can see it's just gradually getting siltier and sandier upwards. And that's the system stepping towards you. It, it, in the form of these rather thin beds with, with turbulent sand beneath and more debridic mud above. So these are just full of little sand grains, speckled sand grains, quite coarse sand grains. Um, so that was in place by a whole series of debris flaws. And then the hybrid event beds arrive. <clears throat> yeah, so this is again in the, in, the, in the east where they're quite muddy. So they're dominated by H3. You can see they're scooping their way through the H1 division underneath. So that, that there's a lot of... Uh, reworking going on during deposition here uh, and then we've got this little trailing uh, sand mud couplet that you can see in core uh, about 200 uh, meters away in, in a borehole so that's a gamma log in the borehole about 200 meters away from the outcrop and you can see that, that upper sand uh, becomes quite dirty and banded and then up into a 
up into pseudonodular mud. So it looks like the, the last part of the flow also has suppressed turbulence in it. So these are the sorts of flows we think maybe were, were kind of uh, the, the turbulence has been suppressed in at least two different ways, you know, but by acquiring class and, and converting to a, to a debris flow, but also by suspended clay from the top down uh, suppressing turbulence. And then this is what, it's this upper level that we think runs distally to form the, these, out, these outflow sheets. So it's a kind of H4, H5 bed that goes distally, we think, rather than the H3 bed, but people have argued about that. The last point I want to make um, uh, in terms of future work is, of course, we, we've been working mainly with, with um, um, you know, siliciclastic systems, but but uh, there's a lot of carbonate and mixed carbonate clastic systems out there, <laughs> including a very nice system underneath the city of Dublin that we're working on. And uh, again, XRF profiling and uh, uh, petrography in, in beds. I mean, they've always been described as calcium turbidites, but but uh, again, uh, <clears throat> you know, transitional and, and laminar flow components seem to be present in, in uh, these. So this is work done by uh, Elizabeth Andres. Okay, just to finish then, uh, you know, this is a discussion meeting, I guess. So I, I just listed a few topics that, that we may or may not come back to. So the, this issue of longitudinal versus vertical stratification, um, you know, how, that, how the turbulence dampening and where does it take place in these flows? What are these, invariably like the XRF scanning is sh showing sharp interfaces all the way through these beds. Uh, what are these? Um, you know, composition and fractionation, particularly of, of mica, it seems to be a, a very good kind of proxy for fractionation in, you know, at present in, in many of these uh, event beds. And it's very strongly fractionated between the different compo bed components. So interaction between different bed components as, as uh, you know, divisions as, as, as they form. So, you know, big issues about relation to deposit to the nature of the flow. And then lastly, uh, relating all the, the mud and silt that's bypassed uh, through the sandier parts of the system to so the outflow sheets is interesting. And you know, it's not entirely clear how the two bits link up. Okay, that's me done. Hopefully not too long.